Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for a Pearson-sponsored webinar, Teaching Strategies for Culinary School Instructors, Preparing Your Students to Rise Above the Competition After Graduation. My name is Carissa Reedy. I'm facilitating this session from our Pearson office in Austin, Texas. Before we begin, I'd like to point out a few housekeeping items. First, you have a control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow, top left, allows you to hide or expand this control panel. The round blue button allows you to move to full screen mode and back. Your control panel also has audio options. You are able to listen to the audio portion of this webinar through either your computer speakers or your telephone. Since we are recording today's session, all lines have been automatically muted. Next, please note that you have the ability to adjust the way the items on your screen appear. Use the layout dropdown at the top left of your monitor to make adjustments to your preference. To participate in the question segment, please type your question in the question box on your control panel and click send. Feel free to send in questions at any time. I will be moderating throughout the duration of the webinar. Also, please note that we have the PowerPoint slides available for you to download during the presentation. You can find this file on your control panel under the handout section. With that said, I'm so happy to introduce our presenter for today, Daniel Traster. Daniel Traster is the Culinary Director for the Metropolitan Cooking and Entertaining Show, a freelance writer, culinary consultant, and author of three books, Welcome to Culinary School, A Culinary Student Survival Guide, Foundations of Cost Control, and Foundations of Menu Planning. He has eight years of experience in culinary arts education. He is the former Dean of Culinary Arts and Hospitality Management at Stratford University. He is also the former Academic Director for the Art Institute of Washington. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I will turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Carissa. It is a pleasure to be here, uh, and I'm excited to talk to everybody about uh, how your students can rise above the competition. To get there, we, we need to talk about the teaching strategies for instructors and uh, how to help your students achieve that excellence. So let's get started with question. Great. Go ahead, Carissa. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch this first poll question. Okay, you should see it on your screen now. For most of the instructors in your school, when is the teaching of a lesson complete? All of the content is covered. The students have gained proficiency in the content. Time runs out in the class or course. Lessons are never completed. Please vote now. And while everyone is voting, it's uh, interesting to look that there's no incorrect answer to this particular question, but it'll Tell a little bit about your focus, whether it's a teacher-driven focus, a common learner focus driven by course objectives, a practical focus, or a lifelong learning focus. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Great. Thank you. OK. We've got just a few more votes coming in. So just in one more second here. OK. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And let's look at the results. Okay, 8% responded, all of the content is covered. 60% responded, the students have gained proficiency in the content. 8% responded, time runs out in the class or course. And 24% responded, lessons are never completed. Okay, back to you, Daniel. So that's a common approach, actually, among teachers. 60% uh, there saying, that students have gained proficiency in the content is the marker. And that's actually a great measure. We're going to be talking a little bit about that today. But uh, let's go over the objective and agenda for today. 
So today's objective, by the end of today's webinar, you will be able to explain how teaching techniques should change across different environments and apply at least one effective teaching method to each of three environments. We'll go over the importance of learning over teaching, the Gagne Briggs nine events of instruction model, uh, the three teaching lo locations, those different environments I mentioned, the kitchen lab, the traditional classroom, and the home classroom or online uh, course. Uh, and then we're going to talk about teaching students how to learn on their own, which I think you will find to be a key, or at least one of the keys, to helping your students get past the competition as they enter the workforce. So let's talk about teaching and, and the truth about what teaching is. First of all, teaching is not about delivering content. You've probably heard that before if you've been teaching for a little while. Um, I know it's quite ironic that we're doing a webinar which is mostly about presenting content, but uh, in a classroom, in a teaching environment, there's more going on. We're going to talk about that. Um, teaching is not providing activities that, or excuse me, teaching is providing activities that help students to learn and master the content. Students rarely master something by hearing, seeing it, or doing it once. Students who learn only about 50% from a fairly limited curriculum are still better off than students who learn, let's say, 2% from an extensive curriculum. So it's important to focus on making sure they learn things. Any program where students master a significant quantity of content is successful, no matter how the content is taught. And the measure of a chef instructor is not what he or she knows and can do, but rather what his or her students know and can do. Again, what the students have learned from the process. People sometimes think of teachers as people who stand in front of a class talking while students instantly master everything the teacher says or demonstrates. You probably know that's just not true. Students just don't learn that way for the most part. They must wrestle with the material. They have to practice it, correct their errors, and check their learning before they can begin to master the content. Um, so culinary students learn in all three major forms of learning. You may have heard of this as Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, cognitive, physical, kinesthetic, and affective. Cognitive is mental function, understanding how to do something and being able to perform it on paper or in words. This is often taught in a classroom, whether it's a brick or uh, brick and mortar or online classroom, uh, and often taught through reading or written activities. The physical kinesthetic is a muscular activity, being able to do something where the challenge is mainly physical, like knife skills or cooking. It's typically taught in a lab or kitchen environment. And then there is the affective, the emotional or, or choice uh, arena. Um, this is choosing to do something in a given situation. For example, not just knowing proper sanitation procedure, but choosing to follow proper sanitation when no one is looking because it's the right thing to do. This is taught in all environments. It's usually the hardest to teach. All three in your program are important. For example, using uh, that sanitation uh, concept, right? Cognitive would be learning the temperature danger zone. Physical kinesthetic would be how to measure medium rare by finger pressure. Uh, and affective would be choosing to follow proper sanitation guidelines when, uh, again, when no one is looking. So let's do a quick poll. Chris, I'm going to turn it back to you. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch this next poll question. Okay, you should see it on your screen now. How do you write your lesson plans to guide your teaching? I follow a model-based and instructional theory. I have my own system that I use for writing lesson plans. The school sets my lesson plans for me. I don't use lesson plans. Okay, please vote now. We'll give it just a few more seconds to give everyone a chance to vote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And let's look at the results. 19% voted. I follow a model based in instructional theory. 42% responded, I have my own system that I use for writing lesson plans. 35% responded, the school sets my lesson plans for me. And 4% went with, I don't use lesson plans. Okay, Thanks. back to you. Great, thank you. Well, I'm going to be talking in this particular case, uh, the next few slides, about a model 
based in instructional theory. And as I introduce it to you, uh, you can use this to create your lesson plans as you go. So the model's called the Gagne Briggs Nine Events of Instruction. If you've heard me speak before, you may have heard uh, of this particular uh, approach and theory to teaching because I am a huge fan of it. The Gagne Briggs instructional model was developed by Robert Gagne to make uh, military training as effective and efficient as possible. Consider when you're training somebody to protect their lives and the lives of their fellow soldiers, the instruction better be effective, right? Everyone has a stake in the teaching being effective. Every student ought to be able to ace the exam and retain their learning forever. This is not something where you can grade on a curve or just say, well, some students just aren't strong. Uh, it really is a life and death matter, so they needed it to be effective. But there's no reason why that approach to teaching can't be applied in any situation. So uh, you see these on the screen. I'm going to talk through each of these steps in the nine events of instruction. Uh, and you can use this to create your lesson plan and then follow that lesson plan when you teach to help you become a more effective instructor. First step, gaining attention. Right? This causes the student to focus on the lesson that's about to begin. It can be a simple call to attention, but usually it's more effective when students get a brief lesson in why something might be important for them to learn. Could be, for example, tasting two dishes side by side and seeing uh, one versus the other in the quality, and that way students are uh, paying attention when you're teaching them the right way to do it. Or it could be showing a news headline or a brief video, or as I did with the webinar, asking a question of the group. Step two, stating the objectives. This tells the students how they will know if they are learning what they should be learning. Uh, it keeps the instructor focused. It hints at how the students will be assessed. It also helps the students to filter out any non-essential information. The objective should be observable, measurable, and clearly written. If you've had training and teaching, you probably have heard that before. The next step, recall prior learning. So a lot of times, if somebody throws something out at you and, and uh, it's brand new, you don't know where ne necessarily to stick it in your memory bank. It's easier for students to learn something if they see how it connects to what they already know. It's also easier to recall all of it later when it's mentally filed logically. For example, this is step three in the process. Let's talk about what step two was that we discussed yesterday, just as a reminder. Or remember how we learned about browning meat while sauteing? Well, braising starts the same way. It helps students to make sense of things more easily based on what they already know. Step four, presenting content. This is what students and teachers often think of as teaching. Ironically, this is probably the easiest step. It can be done with a lecture, a demo, a handout, or a reading assignment. Um, if this is where your teaching starts and ends, it won't be effective. And yet, it's what a lot of people think of as the, the beginning and end of teaching. The next step, providing learning guidance. First, you explain the content in a novel way. So you already presented it. Now you have to explain it to students. So students who didn't understand the handout or an equation or reading assignment can better understand it. It includes the explanations of why and how during a demo. But it also includes mnemonic devices to help students recall that information later, things like analogies or songs or rhymes, anything that will help students remember the content. If truly it were all about presenting content, you wouldn't need to teach. It hands students a summary of everything they need to know in class in a nice handy packet, tell them to read it, and then they'd come back to take the test. But we all know it doesn't work that way. The next step is student performance. This is the only way the teacher knows what the student has learned correctly and what has been missed. Right? I'm sure you've all had that experience where you've said, so did everybody get it? And all the heads nod, or there's blank stares, and you have no idea if they really learned it or not. The best way to tell is to ask them to show you what they know. So without the step, the, the student and the teacher are headed toward failure, because the step gives the student a chance to correct their errors before grading occurs. Remember, again, I said earlier, students don't learn everything the first time around. So you need to give them a chance to show you what they got, what they missed, and then you can correct, which is what step seven is, the instructor feedback. The teacher provides feedback on student performance to reinforce the proper learning and correct any errors in learning. 
This performance feedback loop can be repeated over and over again until the student has learned effectively. I realize that in a practical sense, you may not be able to do it so many times in the class that every student can master it. But you have to plan a little bit that there will always be uh, students who, who don't get it the first time around. So it's important to have that feedback loop and plan to repeat it in some cases. In most cases, teachers shouldn't really move to the next step until most of the student performance is strong. Then you get to step eight, assessing performance. This is where students are formally assessed or graded. The assessment should align as closely as possible to the objective. If the objective was physical kinesthetic, for example, the assessment should be as well. Uh, you wouldn't want to ask about knife cuts and say, well, the goal was for students to be able to cut Julianne in a certain amount of time with a certain percentage accuracy and then try to test that by giving them a written exam. You really aren't testing at all that objective. But the assessment can take place daily. The assessment can take place at intervals over the course of the, the program. Um, but it is important to have a final assessment so students know how well they have achieved the goals of the course or the lesson. And then we have enhancing retention and transfer. Retention means being able to recall the learning far into the future. Transfer means taking the learning to a new setting, like being able to cook something in a professional kitchen, not just in a classroom setting, or applying a food science concept, for example, to a new recipe. Gagne Briggs is my favorite teaching model. I use it regularly. If you haven't seen this before, you can find information about it on the internet, but I highly recommend it to everyone. It's the format I use for writing lesson plans. And I encourage you to try to uh, take a lesson that you teach in the near future and give it a shot and see if it changes the effectiveness of the lesson. Now we're going to examine how the model applies to various learning environments. So let's take Gagne Briggs into the kitchen. Right, kitchen lab work is about physical learning. I'll give you a little example here. Right, let's, let's talk about golf, which is not culinary at all, but really good example. You can watch golf on TV all day long. You could study it in books, but you don't really begin to start learning golf until you get out on a golf course and begin swinging. And it really isn't the kind of thing where all the study means that first swing is going to be perfect. It really does take years to master because your, your muscles have to learn what to do. There are adjustments that you get. Uh, and that practice feedback loop is happening internally. You hit the ball a certain way, you can tell immediately your feedback is which direction does the ball go and how do you adjust. It can be easy to understand mentally how to do something, but it requires years to train those muscles to execute it properly. The normal progression with physical kinesthetic learning is gross approximation, then refinement, then mastery. Um, if you have children or have worked with children before, and I mean young children, you'll understand this analogy, right? We're going to talk about Cheerios. Children are a great model for understanding how we learn physically because if you've ever seen toddlers, everything they're doing early on is physical learning, kinesthetic. Um, and if you've seen them try to eat Cheerios, this makes perfect sense because first they try to struggle to get a hold of any Cheerio in their fist, right? There's no uh, refined motor skill there. They, they grab it with a fist, and if something gets stuck in the fist, they learn success. And if they miss, they try again with a different approach. Um, eventually, over time, they learn that they can hold a few in their palm. That's a gross approximation, right? A finger de dexterity, but not really using their fingers. But they begin to refine the motor skills and learn how to pick them up with a pincer movement. That's that refinement of skills. And ultimately, they can learn how to grasp Cheerios or any other object using a combination of fingers, sometimes tools like a spoon or a fork. That's how they work from gross approximation to mastery. And even as people get older and age and things come faster, um, it still works through that process of gross approximation, refinement, and ultimately mastery. From the nine of events of instruction, Learning guidance helps with this, but the repeated practice feedback loop is the most critical element of those nine steps. Um, to understand why guidance doesn't substitute for practice, try demonstrating that pincer movement to a toddler. 
Right? You can talk about it all day long, but they're not going to be able to execute it until they've practiced for weeks. And the same is really true for physical kitchen skills with adults. Um, you've probably seen knife skills or students trying to ice a cake or fabricate meat. Even learning just how to stand on your feet all day and manage a busy station takes practice, repetition, and that practice feedback loop is really what makes a difference here. So the key takeaway I want you to, to take from the model applied to the kitchen is in the kitchen you want to minimize teacher talking time and maximize time for students to practice. Um, teach by providing constant feedback on the student work so they can refine that execution. Don't spend a lot of time talking up front. Do it while the students are working again so that they can repeat and ultimately master everything much faster. You can use the learning guidance uh, step to stress how and why, but again, that practice time is what's key. And as a bonus, if you want to use that gain attention step to show two different results of a dish, one done properly, one done wrong, right at the beginning of your lesson, do that. That way students immediately understand why it's important to follow the steps you're about to demonstrate and they'll tune in with a laser focus on exactly what you're doing. Let's take Ganya Briggs into the classroom. Right, cognitive skills are most commonly taught in the classroom, whether, that, whether it's brick and mortar or an online classroom. And here, emphasizing the providing learning guidance step uh, in Ganya Briggs is what's most important, I believe. In most classrooms, teachers are providing reading assignments in advance. Students theoretically have had at least one day's exposure to the content. And I, I'm, I know you're all on mute, so while I can't hear you, I know you're all laughing at me for suggesting that the students have even done the reading in advance, right? You've given it, and you hope they come in having done it. But I will tell you, do not use the classroom to present content that has already been presented elsewhere, like a reading assignment, unless you present it differently. Not only are you going to suggest to students who are quick learners in this sense that they don't have to read it because you're going to go over all of it again or read it out loud to them in class, but if they couldn't get it by reading it and you just go through and read it the same way using the same terminology, they still won't get it. So it's important. If you're going to use the classroom, do things differently. Um, you, you have to run the class under the assumption, whether it's true or not, that students have done all of the reading. They'll get the message that they have to do the reading in advance, which that alone will help them with their learning. But that said, discuss it in a different way. You can use acronyms, rhymes, diagrams, songs, other mnemonics to help the students understand and recall the information. Right? Start by asking pointed questions from the reading. Show students different ways to solve equations from the ones that are in the text. You can provide illustrations or analogies to help the students better understand a concept. Let me give you an example of something I had to do in a class a few years back, trying to explain how uh, sodium impacts high blood pressure. Right? Salt, if you, you haven't really paid attention to nutrition in the news, really doesn't directly correlate to hypertension. This is hard for students to understand. Some people get high blood pressure when they consume lots of salt, others don't. How are you going to teach that concept when people are looking for a direct cause and effect and that it affects some people, it doesn't affect other people is a harder concept to understand? Well, here's an approach using an analogy students may relate to. Star Wars is currently trendy. So you can use the analogy of a shield around a ship. Right? Sodium is shooting at all the ships in the Starfleet. Only some have their shields up. Those with the shields are not impacted by the salt, while those without shields get high blood pressure. Why weren't all the ships built with the same shields? Well, we just don't know. But we also don't know why some people are impacted by salt and others are not. Students will relate to this. This is one that it's pop culture. They can understand the concept. It helps them to understand the chemistry a little bit better. An example of an illustration, your book can use a math equation to teach food cost and food cost percent. And if your students have trouble manipulating the equation, try this approach. It's one I actually use a lot for people who are math phobic. You take a piece of paper and draw a triangle. So draw a horizontal line across the middle of the triangle and above the line you write FC, 
for food cost. Below the line, write FC percent times sales. Um, if you haven't seen this before or haven't done it, uh, you can practice it right now and see that it works. But you show the students that by covering up the variable they want, the triangle shows them what to do with the other two variables. So if you covered up FC percent, for example, the result that you see in the diagram is food cost divided by sales. It works for all three variables. It's just a different way of teaching from what's commonly seen with equations, and students may not be comfortable manipulating equations mathematically. The reason, again, that you don't present the same content from the reading in the same way is if students didn't get it the first time, they're not going to get it just because you repeat it. There's an old joke about a foreigner coming up and asking you in a foreign language for directions. And they say, blah, 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 and you have no idea what they said. But if they repeat that mumbo jumbo slowly, you don't get it any better. But let's say they try a different approach, saying it in English, for example, you might have a chance of being able to describe which way they should go. So again, take the content and put it in a different format, explain it a different way. Let's, uh, for the practice and feedback step, you should use small group activities, class discussion, Q&A, wrap-ups. Practice feedback is not any less important in the classroom just because it's not a lab. But the scope of time and practice is shorter than in the kitchen because it's not muscle, it's, it's brain activity. And that actually happens faster, believe it or not, than muscle uh, dexterity. So practice sessions should be brief but frequent. Feedback may come from the instructor or, believe it or not, from other classmates. So small group activities, for example, allow for peer guidance. Discussion and Q&A allow for students to correct their learning even if they don't answer the question themselves. So if you ask a question to the group and you call on one student, whether they give the right or the wrong answer, everybody else is trying at that time to think of what the answer is. And as you give the correct answer or confirm the student's correct answer, everybody else is now checking their own learning to say, oh, good, I got that right, or oh, my gosh, I had it wrong. Let me make a mental note of that. And then assessing daily ungraded. Don't wait for the formal exam to do an assessment uh, in the classroom. Recommend peer counseling, study groups, or instructor tutor time when needed. Um, because you want to do that before the students are actually graded. Um, it can be a five-minute ungraded quiz, and then you collect them to see who learned the key points of the lesson and who still struggles. If most of the class struggles, you need to redo the lesson in a different way. If a couple students struggle, then you can see them outside of class and recommend they participate in a study group to help refine their learning. It doesn't have to come from you for the students to learn the content. It's more important just that the students have learned the material before you move on to the next lesson, or certainly at least before you assess them with a formal grade. So Gagne Briggs online and at home, and I need to define a couple of things here. Because online classes and, and the home classroom, which I'm going to define in a sec, um, are all somewhat different depending on their format. So let's talk synchronous online classrooms are similar to traditional classrooms. Synchronous, if you're not familiar with this terminology, um, people are online, but they're all online at the same time. It allows for discussion on the computer, instructor Q&A, small group activities. Essentially, everything that can be done in a traditional classroom, or almost everything, can be done in a synchronous classroom online. Asynchronous online classes have more in common with the home classroom, which, uh, like I said, I'll define in a sec. But Asynchronous basically means it's an online platform, but the student can go on on their own, go through the set of activities. Um, there is not any in-time or simultaneous discussion between other students. Um, this format requires a different teaching approach. Um, asynchronous classes, like I said, resemble the home classroom, where uh, your, your student is learning at home with limited access to teachers. And you're probably thinking, well, isn't this what happens when students are doing homework? And, and I'm going to define it a little differently here. And tell you that if your school does not have an online component, 
don't start tuning me out just yet because the home classroom does apply to you or it should apply to you. Home classroom is when your students are at home and essentially doing independent learning. And they can do that with or without your help. So what are the challenges we have here? Your, your uh, synchronous class, your teachers can write out or provide video for the first five steps of Gagne without any feedback from students. Um, you don't know if they're engaged or if they look confused. So you need to elicit student performance to, by asking uh, for them to answer some questions. You can ask them to write papers, post things online. That gives you a, a sense of that student practice step and you can provide feedback. You assess performance. That can be a little bit difficult for doing formal grading, especially where students can simply look up the answers and respond without the learning, uh, without really learning the information. I've actually uh, done this. You may have been in a similar situation. You go on to something that's an online class. It is asynchronous, and uh, you, you're asked to basically read through material and answer multiple choice questions where the wording is exactly what it was from the material. And so instead of actually learning it, you start going through and taking the test and going back a page to just find the answer. You don't have to actually memorize it. That can always be a challenge. Um, but how we deal with this uh, is a relatively easy solution. For the asynchronous classes, um, let, me, let me jump ahead here and then I'll come back to that assessment issue. Um, for asynchronous classes, the biggest challenges are, believe it or not, stating the learning objectives and enhance, enhancing retention and transfer. And I'm going to just put a little caveat here that I'm working on the assumption you're not teaching kinesthetic culinary skills online because I don't believe there's a great way to do that. But if you're teaching any other skills online here, again, students can just look up the answers without analyzing the content. So the objectives have to be broad and complex enough that the students must synthesize the material into something new that they cannot just look up. If they have to synthesize the material and apply it, that lets you know if they've actually learned it or not. So they have to transfer that retention and transfer step, transfer their learning beyond the scripted lessons of the asynchronous classroom, and the assessments require them to do so. Let's give an example. In a costing class, you can have students cost several recipes, calculate menu prices for them, right? If, if the recipes uh, and all the information that's there is not something they have uh, just cut and pasted before, but rather it's new numbers, they have to follow the procedure they have understood, it shows that they understand the procedure and the whole process of costing. In a nutrition class, you could have students analyze a given diet and propose changes that they have to explain and defend. In a cooking theory class, provide students case studies and ask them to explain uh, how they analyze the situation. In various classes, research papers may be appropriate. Unfortunately, automated grading for an asynchronous class is often moderately effective at best. Automated grading requires exacting answers to a fairly narrowly worded question, such as a fact pairing, like the temperature danger zone is blank, fill in the blank. Um, fact pairings are often taught and can easily be looked up um, directly. It doesn't require a lot of thought, just strict memorization. So open book tests don't teach anything. If you can find the answers, and that's essentially what you have in an asynchronous class, unless, again, you have that transfer step. So require them to synthesize the content and apply it to a new situation to demonstrate the transfer. I realize this was all a lot of complicated information, so we're going to take a breather and do a poll question. Carissa? Yes. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch this next poll question. Okay, you should see it on your screen now. How does your school approach the competency of learning how to learn on your own? We teach it in specific courses or lessons. If students ask, instructors will coach them on it. We don't teach this competency. I don't understand the question. Okay, please vote now. Okay, we'll wait just a few more seconds to give everyone a chance to vote.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And let's look at the results. 46% responded, we teach it in specific courses or lessons. 35% responded, if students ask, instructors will coach them on it. 12% went with, we don't teach this competency. And 8% responded, I don't understand the question. Okay, back to you, Daniel. Great. Okay, well, um, that's actually surprisingly good to know that a lot of schools are teaching it in courses and that instructors are coaching them on it. Uh, and that's fantastic. Now, we're going to give everybody one more poll here uh, to find out your student perspective on learning. So, Carissa, go ahead. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm going to launch this next one. You should see it now. While there are always exceptions, how do the majority of your students view learning? Learning is for school and ends at graduation. Learning is a lifelong pursuit. Even in school, they don't want to learn. I don't know how they view learning. Okay, please vote now. Okay, just a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll, and let's look at the results. Okay, 22% responded with learning is for school and ends at graduation. 48% responded learning is a lifelong pursuit. 19% responded even in school they don't want to learn. And 11% said I don't know how they view learning. Okay, back to you. Great. That's fantastic to hear that 48% said learning is a lifelong pursuit. Because the concept of helping your students achieve excellence and outpace the competition, if that's what you've been waiting for, or if you read my blog post and that's why you're here, um, this is the crux of what we're going to be talking about in the last part of the webinar here. And this is where that home classroom concept comes in. So let me define it again or a little bit better. Because uh, the home classroom is, is my term, it's not a term I'm picking up from anywhere else. And this is a situation where students work independently without the instructor present. The students personally direct the pace, the format, and some of the content of their learning. The instructor is less resource and more advisor. Gandhi Briggs in this sense only applies in the sense that students should be encouraged to go through the process on their own. One of the biggest challenges to schools is students not learning how to learn on their own, or perhaps not wanting to learn on their own. Um, they often just don't know how to do it. Instructors spoon feed the information in the way that they direct all of the learning activities, they provide the learning guidance, give feedback. In short, they provide the entire Gagne Briggs process, which I don't discourage. I think that's a great thing. That's part of what school is for. When the goal is a core set of knowledge or skills from the industry, it makes perfect sense. But what happens when the goal is learning how to learn on your own? Well, just as a well-taught class includes setting objectives, presenting content, student practice of the content with instructor feedback and all those steps, learning how to learn includes students learning how to set their own learning objectives, how to find appropriate resources on their own, and how to wrestle with the material to understand it and seek advice from an instructor or some other coach for feedback. And of course, presenting the learning for final evaluation in a way that is personally meaningful to the learner and any appropriate audience. With culinary schools, you all know students don't become executive chefs upon graduation, right? They require years of experience, which is code for additional job-specific training and practice to skill mastery. In other words, they have more to learn to prepare for the job of executive chef. And what happens if they stop learning, either because they don't know how or they choose not to? Well, <clears throat> they're going to stop advancing. Teachers can address both issues, but they do so best in the home classroom, right? To, uh, to learn how to learn, students have to practice learning and researching on their own. Teachers can provide learning guidance on study techniques, right, using flashcards, outlines, how to find resources and proper uh, citation, for example. But students have to practice those techniques on their own. 
and to make to for students to want to learn on their own they have to engage in learning that is personally meaningful and relevant this is a key component of adult education theories students just tune out stuff once they become adults if it's not personally meaningful and significant so have them select something that's personally meaningful and significant examples they could research the culinary traditions of their family's country of origin pick a topic in the culinary world that's personally meaningful and research it study a subject area in the field they'd like to become an expert in we haven't really discussed the affective learning sphere much today but this is a critical area for it it's hardest to teach because it's hard to assess but students may humor you and apply proper sanitation at school and ignore it elsewhere right they aren't choosing to apply it on their own but students will choose they'll, they'll make something uh, personally significant if you allow that in a project and they'll value it and then they choose to do the research um, and it's important for them to understand that things can be personally satisfying uh, and involve research uh, and if they don't choose to learn beyond graduation they'll they'll just never learn and, and uh, they'll stagnate in the industry using the home classroom so how now that we've talked about this just a little bit how do you dip your toe into this arena and help students learn how to learn and encourage them to value lifelong learning so that they can continue to advance and soar past uh, students at other schools once they graduate. Here's what I propose. Assign a research project but allow students to select the topic, the resources, and the form of research presentation. The student topic selection allows for something meaningful that they want to pursue and study. Resources, consider this very broadly. So uh, resources could include people, could include books, recipes, kitchen experiments, workshops, essentially anything, any way for them to learn and gather information. And the form of presentation could be oral speech, it could be a cooking demonstration, a written paper, almost anything. Um, the teacher's role in this is approving the topic scope to make sure it's sufficiently broad. You don't want students to pick something that will take them five minutes to research and be done. Um, you want something that's going to force them to do the research and wrestle with it. You offer advice when asked by the student. So you are one of the resources, but not the sole resource. Part of it is also encouraging them to uh, find other resources. Um, providing the encouragement and checking in on the progress is an important role to make sure students don't leave this to the last minute. And then facilitating a space or an audience for the final presentation so that you're not the only person hearing it, but forcing them to present their research beyond just the teacher-student relationship. And for anyone, if this process sounds familiar, this is the process for doing a PhD dissertation, um, although with a much broader scope of presentation format uh, and a much smaller scope of, of content. Don't panic. I'm not asking you to have your students do a PhD dissertation. I realize they're not ready for this. But this is a, an effective model uh, to show you that this format can work. But there are some practical issues, right, for the home classroom. So first, grading a project will be difficult, right? One approach is to consider pass-fail. It's hard to set up um, a grading criteria uh, if you've got the flexibility built into this project for it to be very, very broad. <clears throat> so consider pass-fail. It makes it much easier on your end and focuses, again, on that skill of students learning how to learn on their own. Use the instructor like that dissertation advisor. The students cannot present until the advisor believes sufficient work has been done so that if the student says, look, I did enough, I don't want to research it anymore, and you can see that it's 10 minutes or one hour worth of research, you can send them back and say, look, I can't allow you to present. You'll fail. Uh, you need to continue to do more. And it helps to uh, encourage and persuade the students to understand what true research and real in-depth study means. The scope of time is also challenging for this home classroom project. For one course, the project might provide 10% of the final grade, right? All or nothing if it's pass-fail. But a broader scope project might span multiple terms, and it becomes merely a pass-fail requirement for graduation. Finally, that public presentation component is essential. I, 
I don't throw that in there as just, oh, it's kind of exciting, let the students uh, do it and show off their stuff. This is essential to the learning process. That applause and public approval will inspire students and encourage them to see that the research has a reward beyond just a grade. Plus, the public may ask questions at the end of the presentation to encourage further research. As students hear each other's research, they may wish to look into other topics on their own or see their peers as good resources for learning. Public recognition also helps the student to see himself or herself as an expert in a topic, thus motivating more research into other areas. Not all students are going to get hooked on lifelong learning, let's be honest. This is um, a project, this is the goal, but not every student's going to get hooked. But most will learn how to do it, so that if they do need to do it or they have a motivation or inspiration later in life, they'll be able to do research on their own. And the more they do to value lifelong learning, the more your graduates are going to advance to the top of the industry. Let's face it, line cooks don't need to learn much after graduation, but executive chefs do. They need to continue to learn, and your students have to do that to grow. It takes a lot of work for you and your students. I, I do not try to hide this. This is a big change for many schools. But I want you to imagine a culture in your school where students grow to love learning. They aren't hindered by format constraints. They choose the topic. They choose the presentation format. <clears throat> and when they graduate, they continue to learn and advance because they're comfortable with the format they've chosen, the style of research, the variety of resources. And 10 years out after graduation, now your graduates hold many high-level, high-profile jobs because they've continued to learn and advance in the industry. Why is this important? Because the public is going to look around and start to associate your school with the top of the industry. <clears throat> Enrollment is going to grow. Your alumni network will be in a position to hire lots of graduates. That's the vision you're aiming for when you teach lifelong learning. Um, that said, I could go on with this for a long time, but I do want to leave some time for questions. So, Carissa, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions and uh, turn it over to you for just a moment. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have had some questions come in, um, and here's the first one. You talked about using the Ghana Briggs model to create a lesson plan. When you teach, what do your lesson plans look like? Great. So when I'm starting to teach, first thing I do is I take those nine steps, lay them out in a, a column, uh, and essentially plug in the information. I don't really uh, do it in order when I'm writing it out. I don't say, all right, what am I going to do for, for step one, gaining attention, and step two, stating the objective. I may do the steps out of order when I'm writing them, but I fill in the blank to make sure that I don't have any steps I have glossed over or missed, uh, and then I teach it in order, because that teaching process, uh, as I suggested, has been proven to be highly effective um, with students learning. So when I teach, that's what I do. I, I uh, start off with Gagne uh, as the outline, and I fill in the blanks for each of the steps. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, well, here's our next question. With online classes, do all grades have to come from essays and broad projects? Is there any room for automated grading? Good question. Um, so automated grading is OK as long as the question and answers require synthesis of information and cannot just be looked up in the book or uh, through online class content. So like I said earlier, um, if it's a costing class, for example, um, don't just have students solve the same problem that they solved earlier. Phrase the question differently, use different numbers, um, make sure that they can do it by understanding the material, not just by looking uh, back in the, uh, the content that's online to find the answer. If it's terminology, for uh, example, to say, um, what is the term for, and then you describe uh, something that you're looking for a specific word for. If that's the way it's phrased in your, um, in your content online, it's just not going to be an effective assessment. Theoretically, uh, it, it's more going to show which students are smart enough to just look back on the page, find the answer, and put it uh, into your test online. So if you can require students to synthesize it or do um, uh, material where there's an exact answer, 
numbers work well for this. Um, yes, automated grading works. If not, it tends to require hand grading where uh, it's more of an essay and student response and the teacher does have to grade it by hand. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, yep. there's one more question. This home classroom independent project seems in, in, intimidating. Do you know of any schools that have done anything like this already? <laughs> Well, uh, that's sort of a yes and a no uh, answer. Um, yes, there are schools, and I know several, that have what they call a portfolio presentation or a restaurant design capstone project um, that they can present to a class or in a public setting. Some of you uh, on the webinar today may have that in your school. Um, and that is a good broad project that does require students to do some independent research uh, they have some flexibility in that uh, they can choose the theme of the project. <clears throat> but on the other hand, it's limited in that, uh, for most schools at least, they're required to put in certain elements and follow certain steps. Um, so the no part of this is I'm advocating for more freedom in project guidelines. Uh, so students take more control and more ownership of their own learning. I don't know of any culinary programs that do that yet, but I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping some of you will consider it because I really do believe that um, teaching students to value lifelong learning uh, is an important skill to know. Um, I, I don't want to make this talk about a book pitch, but in the process of writing and, and doing my books, I have to reach out and contact a lot of chefs in the industry. And when I talk to all these chefs uh, and reach them and, and explain that I'm working for a school uh, or, excuse me, working for a publisher for books that are going to go out to schools, um, I'm always amazed to hear so many chefs in the industry talking about things that they're learning. And all in different formats. Some go on trips and they'll coordinate to meet with various chefs around the world, um, do some training with them, do some tours and learn about projects. Others will tell you quite uh, clearly that they read books, they research, and uh, some visit the library in an old-fashioned format, right? They prefer books instead of just going online. Others will tell you they do go online on a regular basis. Others will tell you that they go to meetings and meet with other chefs and they share information. I don't know any, not one, executive chef that I've spoken with who says, yeah, you know what, I don't really do a lot of learning or research anymore. That was all from school. They all learn. And if your students know that skill, if they know how to learn on their own, they'll be okay. There's a good shot that they'll move ahead. If they don't, my personal belief is there's no chance for them to get ahead and become leaders of the industry. They just can't do it based on the information they learned solely at school. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, well that wraps up our questions for today. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time today, Daniel. We appreciate you being here. And thank you to all the attendees that have joined us for this session. Please take a moment at the end of this webinar to give your feedback in the survey provided. A follow-up message and link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed out to all participants in the next few days. Please feel free to share with your colleagues. Thank you for your time and have a great afternoon.